Today's reading is Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 29. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realising that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favouritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences even bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you, then, who teach others, Do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. All right, let's pray. Gracious, almighty God, your word, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, It can cut deep, but it ultimately points us to Jesus, our great hope and saviour. And so we pray that as we come uh, to this part of Paul's letter to the Roman church, And as it challenges us, may we also remember that we are saved by faith through Christ alone. And I pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I have a little uh, question for you. Which house would you prefer to live in? This one? That, from the outside, looks pretty terrible. It's pretty shabby, might fall down. But when you get inside, it's like, oh my goodness. Wow, that is amazing. Look how beautiful it is. Or, would you prefer to live in this house? A house that, from the outside, looks absolutely incredible. But when you walk inside... It's falling apart. It's dilapidated. It's broken. It's a mess. Well, which house? 
I don't know about you, but I'd definitely pick house number one. But for many of us, for many in the world, they're effectively picking house number two. They present to the world in a certain way, but there's something deeply wrong inside. And that's what Paul is getting at in this chapter. So the big question for you and me today from God's word is, what's going on inside of you? What we're going to see is that the the gospel reveals three things about our hearts. It reveals that our heart has a problem. It reveals that our heart is the problem. And it reveals that we need a new heart. So the gospel reveals that our heart has a problem. Imagine you are a good law-keeping Jew gathered with the church in Rome. And you're hearing Paul's letter for the first time uh, at the end of chapter (coughs) 1. After Paul's scathing denunciation and condemnation of those pagan people who worship idols and engage in all sorts of terrible things and sexual immorality, how do you think you would have been sitting there and feeling as a good law-abiding Jew? Well... Chances are you probably would have been feeling pretty good about yourself. Thinking something like, yeah, right on, Paul. Of course God's wrath lies on those silly, idol worshipping pagans. Look at how we look at how they live. They don't have the law of God like we do. They're not circumcised. Set apart as God's people like we are. We are the Jews. We are God's chosen people. God is on our side. But then the person reading the letter gets to chapter 2. And Paul stops talking about them and he starts talking about you. And as he does that, you're slinking a little lower in your seat. As his words come crashing on you like a bucket of ice cold water, waking you up to that self-righteous problem in your heart. Verse 1, you, the person most likely feeling good about themselves, therefore, just like those I spoke about in chapter 1, have no excuse. Uh Uh-oh. Why? You who pass judgment on someone else, you're doing exactly the same thing. And we have a word for that. You are a hypocrite. Passing judgment here, by the way, is not simply saying that's evil or that's wrong. We, we sometimes confuse that. right? Indeed, we, we, we need to be able to do that. Otherwise, we become like the kind of person that Paul talks about at the end of Romans uh, 1 that approve of things that are evil. Because we can actually do that with our silence. Judging in that sense is simply trusting in what God says is good and evil and standing up for it. But judging here in Romans 2 is about the hypocritical heart attitude that says, you're wrong, you're worthy of God's judgment, unlike me. It's an attitude of the heart that basically takes joy in condemning others because it makes you feel better about you. Paul is making the point that the super-religious moral person has a problem with idolatry just as much as the rest of the world. It just so happens that the idol isn't a statue that you're bowing down to. It's you. And in the end, Paul says, all you're doing is judging yourself. Verse 1, For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. What are those things? Right, you know, Because the Jew would be sitting there going, you know what, I'm not worshipping any idols. I'm not going to the, the, panth- the pantheon of Roman or Greek gods and making offerings to them. What's Paul talking about? But when you go back to chapter 1 and look at the wickedness Paul spells out, the majority of the things he spells out are not outward actions. They're attitudes of the 
heart. Things like evil, greed, depraved mind, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, senseless, faithless, heartless and ruthless. See, the gospel reveals that we all have a problem with our heart. And this is exactly the point uh, that Jesus makes when he, 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 in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapters 5 to 7. He says to the people there, he says, You have heard it said, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Right? It's, it's not hard, is it? To, well, I hope it's not. To get to the end of the day and pat yourself on the back and say, Well done, Christian, for not murdering anyone today. <laughs> but to get to the end of the day and say, Well done, Christian, didn't get angry. Well, that's a whole other level, isn't it? Paul is teaching what Jesus taught, getting to the heart of the problem, as it were. Verses 3 to 4, are you that full of yourself that you think you could escape God's judgment? Do you really show contempt for his grace and his mercy, the very things that are meant to expose your heart and lead you to repentance? In verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're not storing up credit with God, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of judgment. And see, this is not just a problem for the Gentiles, those non-Jews over there. It's a problem for you as well, says Paul, the religious Jew. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's a relief because I'm not Jewish. Think again. All right? Christians today can be just as self-righteous as first century Christian Jews. Verses 9 to 11, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. This is, for, this is about everyone. See, Paul was dealing with an issue in the church that the Gentiles and the Jews were coming together as the new people of God, but they were trying to work out what that means because the Jews thought, oh, we're the special people of God. I mean, what are these guys doing here? Paul's like, guys, no. <laughs> God doesn't show favoritism. All of humanity is in the same boat. We all suffer from the same heart problem. We're all sinners who have rebelled against our creator and we all must repent and come to faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Full stop. The problem with our heart says Paul, is it's stubborn, it's unrepentant. And one major way our hearts are stubborn and unrepentant is that we keep repeating the sin of Genesis chapter 3. We, we think we don't need God. We think we can be all right on our own. We can effectively save ourselves. But if I think God is impressed by my moral efforts, it's a stubborn heart, then guess what I think that I don't need to do? Repent. It's an unrepentant heart. Now, at first glance, it might seem, as we go on in this chapter, that Paul is exa saying exactly that, though. Right? Verse 5, God's righteous judgment is coming. So, verse 6, God will give to each person according to what he has done. Verse 9, trouble is coming for all who do evil, but glory, honor, and peace for all who does good. Now, is Paul having this kind of multiple personality moment? Because the rest of Romans says, oh, saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Is he actually just kind of like you know, having a brief moment where he's gone back to his Jewish roots and gone, no, actually, we need to do good to be saved? No. You see, Paul, through the work of the Spirit, uh, is a master at wielding God's word. So that God's truth cuts right to the heart. The question we need to ask is, what is the good that the people need to do in order to receive the gift of eternal life? And the answer is Psalm 62. That psalm that Nick read for us at the start. 
You see, in verse 6, Paul is quoting the end of the psalm. Verse 12 of the psalm, God will give to each person according to what he has done. So what is the, uh, the good one does to receive the gift of salvation? And when you read that quote in its context in the psalm, the answer is trust in the Lord. Because Psalm 62 paints a picture of someone who finds rest in God alone, knows that salvation comes only from the Lord, looks to God as their rock and fortress in times of trouble, knows that their ultimate hope comes from him, knows that and notice the language that Paul picks up on out of Psalm 62. Verse 7, my salvation and my honor depend on God. A Psalm 62 person is a person who trusts in the Lord at all times. And this is the answer that Jesus himself gave in John chapter 6, verse 29, when, when the people there were said, what do we need to do to do the work of God? And Jesus says the work of God is this, to believe in, right, trust, have faith in the one whom he has sent, Jesus. Don't hear me say that we shouldn't do good. Of course we should do good. Absolutely. And Paul's going to get deep into that. Chapter 6, he's going to start talking about it. Chapters 12 to 15, that's what it's all about. About the life we are to live as the saved people of God. But if we think that our moral efforts count for something when we are trusting in ourselves and not Jesus. Sorry. But if we think that our moral efforts count for something, then we are trusting in ourselves, not Jesus. Good works are the fruit of real faith, not the cause of it. It's fruit from faith, right? Apples on an apple tree prove that the tree is alive and well. The apples actually don't provide life for the tree. If you grab a bunch of apples and you nail them to a dead tree, what's going to happen to that tree? Nothing. <laughs> Right? It's the roots of the tree that draw in the nutrients and give the tree life that in turn produces fruit. See, I do know something about gardening. We draw life from Jesus. It is faith in him that saves, but it's a changed life. It's a life that will in turn produce fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Right? It demonstrates that we have real faith. This is what Paul is saying to the morally religious Jews who think they're all good before God because they know the law and keep his commands. All right? And we, we can see this in ourselves in two ways. We, either we take pride in the fact that we're morally right, right? You be, and you believe that you can be good enough for God and that you are good enough for God and you get puffed up with pride. But it's equally the same for those who get, uh, fall into pits of despair. And they fall into despair because they still believe that you can be good enough for God, but they recognize that they're failing miserably. But there's a third way. Gospel humility, if you like. The heart that says, I can never be good enough for God, but Jesus was good enough for me. And I am declared righteous through faith in him. See, Romans is building to this point. When we rely on anything or anyone other than Jesus to give us the righteousness we need, we are refusing to accept the truth of the gospel. It's not just that your heart has a problem. Your heart is the problem. And so this is the second point. The gospel reveals our heart is the problem, right? And Paul continues in this uh, very dense chapter. In verses 12 to 15, he's basically saying, you know the law, whoopity do. And then verses 25 to 29, he's basically saying, you've been circumcised. Oh, wow. You think having the law, knowing the law is what makes you the righteous people of God? You think God is impressed by some religious ceremony? That's like nailing apples onto a dead tree and claiming the tree is alive and well. 
In verses 14 to 16, he basically is saying, Meanwhile, the Gentiles, those non-Jews over there who do not have the law, they are actually obeying the law. They're showing that something has actually happened inside them. A changed heart. They show that the law is written on their hearts. And something that will be confirmed on the day when God will judge all of our hearts. I mean, interesting point. Uh, Paul is actually tapping in to key promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. Just tuck that thought away. We'll get back to that. Then verse 17, Paul sets off a bomb. Right? If you then call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about how you are God's special people, if you call yourself a Jew, if, if is a nuclear word right here. That Paul is addressing to people who, at the core of their identity, they understand they're Jews. If we are a Jew, really, Paul? Of course we're Jews. We're the descendants of Abraham. God gave us the covenants. We have the law of Moses. We've been circumcised. If you call yourself a Jew. Is he serious? Paul is speaking to people who are morally decent. At least to the point that they take the law of God seriously. And who keep all the religious practices. Circumcision was chief among them. Right? They're effectively the two pillars of Jewish righteousness. Right, The things that they had that made them feel better than everyone else in the world. And now he takes the sharp edge of the gospel and he drives it in. Because the gospel reveals that your heart is the problem. If you pride yourself in keeping the law and you think that you are superior to others, a guide for the blind, instructor for the foolish, teacher to infants, the list goes on for Paul. Then he he rams it home. He says, verse 21, Then you who teach others, do you teach yourself? Do you practice what you preach? Are you a hypocrite? And it was at this point during my preparation during the week that I realized... Oh my goodness, I'm going to get up and preach this. (laughs) Are you a hypocrite? Verse 24, the only thing you're achieving is basically dragging God's name through the mud. And Paul can hear the Jews try to push back at him. But we're circumcised. Verse 25, circumcision has value, says Paul. Oh, I thought so. If you obey the law. But if you break the law, your physical outward religious practice that you think makes you right with God is useless. Verse 26, but if the uncircumcised, the the non-Jews, if they keep the law, guess what? Even though they haven't gone under the knife, they'll be regarded as circumcised. Now that is astounding. He's he's, 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 he's building to what is coming at the end of the chapter, but he's basically said, those Gentiles over there, they're more Jewish than you. See, the gospel exposes our sinful hearts are the problem. There are basically two kinds of people in the world. And we can say this in all manner of ways, but in a Romans 2 way, there are those who are blind to their their hypocrisy, And then there are those who know they're hypocrites. Hypocrites who need Jesus. We all do it. We all fail at some point not practicing what we preach. From the time we learn to speak, I see it with kids, you know, pointing out the faults of their siblings, not realizing that they're doing the same thing. Oh, look what they're doing over there. Get them in trouble. The law shouldn't lead you to strive for your righteousness. It should lead you to surrender to Jesus' righteousness. See, the law of God is a mirror that when you hold it up, it shows you how utterly incapable you are of attaining the righteousness you need to stand before the Lord. 
And instead of puffing you up with your own sense of moral superiority, what the law should do, it should drive you to the cross of Jesus. See, hypocrisy is is dangerous for you and me as the church today, as much as it was for religious people, Jews in Paul's day that he's writing to. We need to be aware of that. We need to guard that. And there are four major ways that I I can see that the the modern church in in the Western world uh, kind of is going down that hypocritical road. Four different kinds of churches, and sometimes churches can be a mix of this. Now, don't hear me say, that's what I think of you guys. This is a broad brush, okay? So you've got some churches that think they're morally superior. They do lots of good things in the community. Their teaching is often a bit fluffy. It's all about how God is love, and that's all they talk about. Functionally, they communicate. What are they doing? Functionally, they're communicating that you can be righteous by doing good things. By being loving and accepting just like God is. Then there's the theologically superior churches. They pride themselves on how right they are. Teaching reinforces just how righteous they are because they are accurately and, 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 and uh, uh, fastidiously understanding the Bible. Functionally, what do they communicate? They communicate that you can be righteous by how correct your doctrine is. Then there's the spiritually superior churches. They tend to overemphasize perhaps miracles and spiritual experiences, tongue speaking, healings, dramatic answers to prayer, if you just have enough faith. Functionally, what are they teaching? They're teaching that you are righteous if you have a deep enough and emotional enough experience of God. Then there's the traditional or the ritually superior church, right? Great emphasis on their history and ritual practices. Functionally, what are they teaching? They're teaching that you're righteous when you come to church regularly, when you sing the old hymns, not the new ones, when you take the Lord's Supper, go to confession, all that kind of stuff. But the moment we think we can be righteous before God by our own efforts, And not by faith in Jesus? Hypocrite. When Jesus was taking uh, taking the Pharisees to task, you know, the Pharisees, those Jews who presumed to be Israel's teachers about how to be righteous before God, when Jesus was taking them to to task, to school in Matthew 23, he called them all manner of things. Uh, One of the most stinging, I think, is when he says, uh, you hypocrites, you are white washed tombs which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and he says in the same way you appear as righteous but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness dead on the inside the gospel reveals that we are dead on the inside and we need a new heart The heart is our problem. We need a new one. I mean, are are you more concerned with reputation or character? Are you more concerned with how people see you or what God sees? We all try to present our best in public. Social media is wonderful for that, by the way. But when you are alone, when only God can see you, that's the real you. And the gospel reveals our heart is the problem. So you know what? Turn up here on a Sunday in your pajamas if you want. I wouldn't care. Because God doesn't care. Turn up in your Sunday best, all smiles, as if nothing is wrong, feeling morally superior. I do care, because so does God. Tim Keller says this. He says, "We all face judgment and all deserve wrath. It is only from the ground that we are able to look at the. It's only from this ground that we are able to look at the cross and see it clearly. We cannot appreciate who Christ is unless we have first acknowledged who we are." 
If you don't know you need the gospel, you don't get the gospel. The gospel reveals the new heart we need. This is the third point, of course. So Paul builds to this point, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. The real Jew, the real people of God, the real Israel, is a matter of the heart. And the new heart we need is only something God can give you. It only comes by grace. It's a heart that God gives us so we can know Jesus and put our faith in him. Now remember that little phrase about how the law is written on their hearts and how I said Paul has got some Old Testament prophecy working in the background there. Well, feast your eyes on this. These are some of the most important passages in the Old Testament that point us to the truth that Paul is getting at and that he's going to expound even more a bit later. Deuteronomy 30 is particularly at work in Paul's thinking, especially when we get to chapter 10. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts, not the other thing. And the hearts of your descendants. Why? So that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. We need that heart in order to know God and love him. It's what Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 24, 7. I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord. They will be my people. I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. Ezekiel picks it up. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20, uh, which he repeats again in 36, 26. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people. They will be my people. They will be, in in a Romans 2 sense, the real Jews. And I will be their God. Or Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That's where he gets it from. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. New heart so you can know the Lord and live for him. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. When you put your faith in Jesus, God forgets that you're a hypocrite. I mean, what does a circumcised heart look like? It's a heart that knows I'm a hypocrite, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus. It's a heart that is a a Psalm 62 heart. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. It's a heart that looks to the cross of Jesus and hears the word of the Lord. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now, going back. When Paul says in Romans 2, you know, there'll be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. There's a double edge to that. Because who actually does the good that actually deserves that? It's Jesus. Because no one is that good. That's what he's uh, building to. Spoiler alert, that's next week's sermon. Verse 13, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Who's the only one who obeyed the law perfectly? Jesus. 
So you ready? You're saved by good works. Did you know that? Don't write to presbytery. Think about it. You are saved by good works. They're just not your good works. They're Jesus. Right, do you, you know, in verse 16, Paul says, you know, do you want God to judge your secrets? <laughs> this invisible camera that's been following you around, and when you're alone, picking up all the thoughts that you've had? Because no one will be justified by their good deeds. We are justified because of Jesus' good deeds. That he is the one who kept the law perfectly for us. We're justified by works. By his works. The righteous life he lived for us. The new heart we need is the heart God has given us. It's a heart that keeps looking to the cross of Jesus day after day, week after week, year after year. Because it's a heart that knows there is nowhere else to go. There is no love like the love of God in Jesus. So let me leave you with three thoughts that assures you you have that new heart. Firstly, you have a new heart if you know your old heart was the problem. Secondly, when you look at those outside the church, you don't do it with judgmental contempt, but with a holy sorrow and compassion. Because you know, I'm no better than them. They need a new heart just like I needed a new heart. And thirdly, you know that on that day when God presses play on that invisible tape recorder and judges your secrets, that you would have no hope were it not for Jesus standing right there next to you, speaking to the Father on your behalf, saying to him, Father, they're one of mine. I died for them. I clothed them in my righteousness. They're covered by my blood. Welcome home. Let's pray. Lord God, forgive us for our hypocrisy when it uh, rears its ugly head. But thank you that you have given us new hearts that recognize that very truth. That we are sinners in need of salvation. Help us look to Christ more and more each and every day. To grow in him. To become less hypocritical. To be people of grace, mercy and love. The same grace, mercy and love you have shown us undeserved in Jesus. Thank you that it is not by our righteousness that we can stand before you. It is not by our works that we will be saved. Because if that was true, we would be in a lot of trouble. But we give you all praise, honour and glory that it is because of Jesus. It is because he went to the cross. He died for our sin. We're clothed in his righteousness. We are assured of your love forever because of Jesus. Thank you. And may the gospel truth shape our lives. And we pray all this now in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.